I'm mentally tough and it was the first time that like I had been broken down. Do you think there's a lot of fear on this team? Mm -hmm. So much. They are athletes who dreamed of playing at the highest level, but they say UC Berkeley's soccer program quickly turned into a nightmare. I mean, you don't get to this level without having had tough coaches. He treated some girls so poorly that they started becoming depressed and started becoming um, just mentally not stable. Woman after woman coming forward to share their stories. There's absolutely fear of retribution. I mean, that's the reason that half of my teammates aren't in here right now. Of verbal abuse, fear. He just laid into me, screamed for 20, 30 minutes. He comes in and he goes, what was it? what happened at halftime does not leave this locker room. Intimidation and punishment on the field. I ran until I couldn't feel my arms anymore. I got super lightheaded. He was overworking us so hard and no one really understood why. And they say their complaints about their toxic team and the man in charge have been swept under the rug. I think it's a shame on Cal Athletic Department. A problem much bigger than just one school, but rather a system that doesn't protect athletes. A woman's testimony is evidence. That's evidence. We're not gonna let them keep hurting people the way that they hurt us. This is a KTVU investigation, surviving the game. A little over a year ago, KTVU started hearing from women from the Cal soccer program. They wanted to talk about their coach, their experience, and what they described as bullying, hazing, and mistreatment. And they wanted to talk about what happened when they went to Cal for help. Now, one player's experience could have been explained away as personality conflicts, resentment over playing time, or frustration over a career. But we didn't hear from just one player. We heard from a dozen, multiple players from multiple teams, all Americans, scholarship and non-scholarship players, some who played four years, some who quit, one who was cut. And all the players had stories with disturbing similarities. And all the players blamed head coach Neil McGuire. For many athletes, the love of the game starts early. I first started playing when I was about four or five years old. I've been playing soccer since I was five years old. As they grow, so does the dream. I always wanted to play in college. It's a dream that demands sacrifice. So I ended up actually making a decision my sophomore year to do online high school so that I could still do the academic stuff that I wanted to be doing, take the more rigorous courses, but still devote my time to what I loved, which was soccer. It was that important. Yeah, it was everything for me. For most athletes, playing in college won't happen. According to the NCAA, there are more than 400,000 girls in high school who play soccer. The chance of getting a spot at a Division I school like Cal is just 2.4%. But for the elite few, those dreams become reality. He said Cal, and I was like, oh my gosh. I had the biggest smile on my face. and That was the dream? Yeah, that was the dream. And yet, for the women we interviewed, that dream became a nightmare. I'm mentally tough and it was the first time that like I had been broken down. It wasn't an issue of a yeller. It was, um, I personally think, emotional and um, mental abuse. Any love I had for soccer, he completely took away. They are talking about Cal women's soccer and head coach Neil McGuire. McGuire has been Cal's head coach since 2007, and according to the school, has coached the team to 12 NCAA tournament appearances. His bio on the Cal website lists several well-known players that he has coached, including Alex Morgan. She is one of the most decorated players in Cal history. But players say that bio doesn't tell the whole story. Do you think there's a lot of fear on this team? Mm-hmm. So much. A dozen players, past and present, came to KTVU for help. Some went on camera, others wrote letters. Some would only tell us their stories if we agreed not to reveal their identity. There's absolutely fear of retribution. I mean, that's the reason that half of my teammates aren't in here right now. Hannah Kosky says she speaks out to protect the next generation of athletes. She went to Cal in 2013, a scholarship player who had played for McGuire before in high school when he coached her at the Danville-based Mustang Soccer Club. I wanted to play for him. I thought it was like a dream to go continue to play for this guy. When she committed to Cal, she says she was warned about McGuire by another player from another school. Because I'm like, I play for this guy. Like, who, what does she know? Turns out, four years later in 2017, Caroline Clark would get that same warning. When I decided to come to Cal, I was warned 
multiple times from multiple people. They had told me essentially what we're all here to talk about right now is that he is not a good coach. He's emotionally abusive. He um, just, they just all warned me that no one has had a great experience. She didn't listen either. It never crossed my mind that it would be something that I couldn't handle. The players say recruiting trips and initial meetings with Coach McGuire went well. At first I thought he was very nice. Um, he seemed like a genuine person. And my parents met him. I met him on several occasions. There were never any red flags. But they also say they started noticing problems early on, starting with Coach McGuire's erratic mood. Every day in practice, you don't know what's going to essentially set him off. I would say probably a couple weeks into season, um, I just kind of started to experience how he was treating some of the girls, and um, it was just very degrading. Every player told us about brutal one-on-one -on -one meetings with their coach. It was not infrequent, it still is not infrequent for girls to leave his office in tears. I remember, <laughs> I remember like when we would all know, like all my best friends, when their meeting was with Neil um, and would text each other media after, like, are you okay? Um, my never mom. Never good meetings? No, oh, never good, no. Players say some had it harder than others. The freshmen in my class that weren't on scholarship definitely got the bread of his his anger when we would lose. But Caroline Clark says being favored didn't spare her from the emotional toll. He definitely was treated me personally better than players that weren't playing on the team. I definitely took notice of that and I took notice of how his behavior individually towards other players. I felt really guilty because of that. And then there were the games, more specifically the losses. I witnessed him yelling at um, one girl on the team so badly or after um, a game and blaming it all on her when it was not her fault. Olivia Sakani says she was that one girl more often than not and described one game when he came onto the field at halftime to yell at her. He used a couple of expletives that I'm not going to say. Obviously, he was close to my face and very angry. Two days later, she says the screaming continued at practice. I sat probably about this distance from him um, as he just laid into me, screamed for 20, 30 minutes. My whole team, everyone's just sitting there silent just because, like, what else can you do? Players say in some cases it was clear that Coach McGuire knew what he was doing was wrong. And he comes in and he goes, what was what happened at halftime does not leave this locker room. And he knew he had just crossed the line too far. And while there were emotional scars, players also say they suffered physically too. Sakani says she went on crash diet after crash diet. She upped her workouts to try to satisfy her coach. She frantically tried to drop weight to meet some unattainable standard and to get the target off her back. I was just trying everything in my power to fix whatever was wrong with me so that he would stop coming after me and he would just let me play soccer because that's all I ever wanted to do. Did he ever stop coming after you? No, he never did. And then there is what they now call rain gate. It started with a canceled practice for weather. The players thought they would train on their own to prove their dedication, but Coach McGuire found out. He yelled at us saying, like, whose idea was this? The captains took responsibility. Um, and so he suspended them from the team. And that's when they say he instituted his own punishing workout. I ran until I couldn't feel my arms anymore. And then on the last lap, I was still running. Um, and on the last lap that we were doing, my vision went black as I crossed the finish line. And I just, I just started saying, I can't see, I can't see. And so then he sent me off with the assistant coach down to the training room. I got super lightheaded. I was laying on the training table with my feet up just to help with the situation and um, I remember then like it was first me and then one more girl came down to put her feet up then one more girl came down to put her feet up and like by the end of it there was just a row of girls like about to pass out because he was overworking us so hard and no one really understood why. And the women say none of it yielded what everyone wanted winning seasons. The program hasn't gotten results. No. Never. And I think that speaks to the coaching. Individually, each player responded a little differently to McGuire's coaching. Caroline Clark quit, giving up her scholarship. 
what it boiled down to was that he, any love I had for soccer, he completely took away. Um, and I just like was, I just wasn't happy anymore. Hannah Kosky also quit giving up her scholarship, but not right away. I honestly stayed uh, because I knew it was going to be bad the rest of my career, but I stayed because my new dream was to get into Haas Business School and I knew playing a sport really helped your chances at getting in. Um, so that was my sole goal to play through junior year. After she quit, she ended up being a star athlete on the triathlon team. Renee Thomas was cut, but still hopes to get a shot at proving herself. All of the girls that were cut um, were not on scholarship, including me. Um, we were all freshmen. Olivia Sakani stuck it out, but purposely graduated early to get away from Cal. Multiple players told us the stress and anxiety of tiptoeing around McGuire led them to seek mental health counseling or start taking antidepressants. He treated some girls so poorly that they started becoming depressed and started becoming um, just mentally not stable. And if you are asking, why didn't they say something? Why didn't they report him? Several say they did. Although it took time, they say, to gather their courage. But I knew there was girls coming in behind me where soccer was their whole world, and if this were to happen to them, I, don't, I could have seen a girl hurting themselves. There's this sort of stigma in women's sports that, you know, as girls and women, we just have to tough it out. And, you know, if we complain, we're seen as weak and soft. But they say when silence was no longer an option, they took their complaints to the head of the athletic department, multiple players, multiple times. We started talking and the two of them looked at us like we had each had five heads. They said they had never heard anything bad about Neil McGuire. So what was Cal's response? We reached out and requested interviews with Cal's head coach, the athletic director, and the people the players turned to for help. Cal's response when we come back. Welcome back. You've heard from the players and their allegations of abuse and mistreatment by their coach. But there are bigger questions here. What did UC Berkeley know? And how did the university respond? Multiple players say they reached out to Cal for help. And here's what they say happened next. The players we interviewed all say they spoke up. Caroline Clark told Coach McGuire how she felt when she told him she was quitting the team. I definitely think I did tell him everything I would like to at the last meeting. Um, I just hope he heard it. I don't think he did, but I don't think he ever will. I think he's just in denial. Hannah Kosky asked for a confidential meeting and presented this four-page letter to the university before she quit. It took months after I was done because I was so scared of this man. Olivia Sakani and two other players also sat down for a meeting in 2019 with athletic department officials. And our athletic director is new at this point and we thought, you know, he's got fresh eyes, like maybe he won't stand for this because, you know, we've heard stories in the past of girls go in and give their exit interviews and they give horrible reviews and nothing ever happens. And it all just gets swept under the rug and nothing ever happens. Renee Thomas filed a lawsuit claiming she was unfairly cut from the team. The university wouldn't comment on the pending litigation. The whole lawsuit as well, it's just very overwhelming. All the women we've talked to say they hoped the university would hear them. Just hopeful they'd look into it. and um, They told you they would? And told me they would, and just to give us girls a voice. But all say their attempts to get help didn't turn out like they thought they would. When we used terms like emotional abuse, um, they were condescending in a way, you know, as if we didn't understand the implications of using terminology like that, which we very much did. We had discussed it at length and decided that that is absolutely an appropriate term to describe what he'd been doing to us. And I had zero communication. Nothing. Never heard from them again after that meeting? Never. And I was promised a survey would be sent. Um, and I remember looking back at my emails and it had been 221 days and I emailed them. Um, you know, how, this is really how Cal handles complaints. We reached out to Cal and requested interviews with the athletic director, Jim Knowlton, Chancellor Carol Christ, Associate Athletic Director Jennifer Simon O'Neill, and head coach Neil McGuire. We also directly reached out to Knowlton and McGuire. The players all signed waivers, allowing the school to talk specifically about their cases. But Cal denied our request for those interviews, saying 
due to the pending litigation, as well as our legal obligation to keep personnel matters private. No campus employee is able to comment on or respond to the specific issues and allegations you have described. In addition, those employees named in the allegations, as well as those who were, are involved in the response to these issues and allegations, are unable to participate in any interviews about these matters in order to protect the integrity of the legal process. The players believe Cal never took a serious look into their allegations. I got a response to that um, from the associate AD, who then phone called me and said, yeah, we looked into it, nothing's there, and that was the end of story. They just said, well, you know, it's, a, it's an in-house issue. Um, we'll handle it from here. We don't need anything else from you. KTVU reviewed correspondence between players and parents with Cal. In an email from September 6th of 2019, Simon O'Neill told Sakani's mother, we have looked into the allegations and have spoken with coaches, student athletes, department and campus staff, parents and others who interact with the program. And a follow-up email from Athletic Director Jim Knowlton in October of 2019 stated, we found that your allegations were not validated and specifically said the rain workout that players called dangerous and punitive was found to be compliant with criteria for conditioning workouts set forth by the department. Who they talked to? We have no idea. Um, no one, none of my teammates that I've spoken to have been approached. No one knows of anybody having been approached. No parents that we've spoken to have ever been approached. Um, the idea that they would approach the coaches themselves and ask if they were abusing us and ask, like, expect a legitimate answer is kind of comical. KTVU also filed a California Public Records Act request asking for the results of any investigations into the treatment or mistreatment by these players. We were told by the Public Records Office that no investigative reports exist. Cal said there would only be something in writing if the university had found an employee violated policy. And even then, it would not disclose any information about investigations into what it calls poor workplace performance. However, a spokesperson confirmed to us that there is a review underway concerning matters that KTVU has asked about, and that review has not concluded. There are no mechanisms in place by which athletes ha can get sufficient recourse in instances of this type of abuse and mistreatment. New York-based lawyer Tim Nevius is not involved in the Cal case, but says there is a larger problem with the system. He was a college athlete and worked as an NCAA investigator, looking into complaints like these. Now, he represents athletes. The NCAA does not um, monitor or regulate coach um, abuse and mistreatment of this nature. They don't even enforce health and safety standards, uh, including um, excessive workouts or punishments that are brought on the athletes by the coaches because they're upset for some reason. Cal told KTVU in a statement that student athletes are all given information about how to communicate concerns, such as end of season surveys or exit interviews with the athletic department heads. But players we talked to say those meetings and the surveys didn't happen. Cal says players can also go to the Office for the Prevention of Harassment and Discrimination, which they did. Players and parents also outlined their allegations in this correspondence from November of 2019. Nevia says those steps don't do enough to protect athletes, not just at Cal, but across the country. Unfortunately, I think it's a big problem that there have been dozens of cases that have been reported just over the last couple of years. How big of a problem? Well, we found several similar cases that have made headlines across the country. Turns out this isn't just a Coach McGuire problem or a Cal problem for that matter. More on that when we come back. Welcome back. You've heard from the players and the university, but a conclusion to a story like this is complicated. Even if the university responds, the soccer careers are over for most of these women. And there are bigger questions that remain. Questions about athlete treatment, protection, reporting, and oversight for all athletes. It was something that I loved for so long, and it's still to this day, like, I don't have any intention of wanting to touch a soccer ball. Most of the women we talk to say this is a story with no happy ending, at least when it comes to Cal soccer. I would probably say I'm one of very few you who would ever pick up a ball again. Renee Thomas hopes her lawsuit will still give her a chance at playing, but that comes with a price too. 
the tears. It's for soccer and the whole experience and how um, it ended. Um, I just worked my whole life to get to that point. Olivia Sakani still has a couple of years of eligibility and will play for another program. I just can't leave knowing that I did nothing about it. But their story is not a unique one. Athlete maltreatment is the subject of ongoing research from sports psychologists at the University of Toronto. We've learned that experiences of psychological abuse, physical and sexual abuse, neglect and bullying are far more common than we would like to believe. And headlines in recent months echo the stories Cal players have told us. Workouts used as punishment and a culture of fear and intimidation. Nebraska softball coach Ron Ravel has been placed on paid administrative leave. Nebraska softball players accused their veteran coach of systematic emotional abuse and a toxic culture on the team that included fat shaming, verbal abuse, and erratic and harassing behavior. That coach was investigated but reinstated. At Rutgers, 10 of 22 players left the softball program after the 2019 season, complaining about dangerous conditioning sessions and physical and emotional abuse. It is softball, it's soccer, it's volleyball at Oregon State. Attorney Tim Nevius doesn't represent any athletes in this story, but says this is part of a bigger problem. So unfortunately, I think these types of scenarios are more widespread than people realize. And we've seen dozens of cases over the last two years alone, uh, primarily in women's programs, that follow a strikingly similar pattern of abuse and mistreatment. And unfortunately, with very little uh, response and accountability, um, in reaction to it. He says athletes today are tougher than they've ever been, but says coaches have too much control over athletes. Indigo Gibson, a starter and All-American from 2014 until 2018, wrote us a letter about her experience at Cal. She says Coach McGuire used her close relationship with her father, who played professional soccer, against her, saying he would discuss my relationship with my father as a sign of weakness in my development as a player. Just one way, she says, he got involved in their lives outside of soccer, outside the lines of being a coach. Those coaches often have unchecked power over the athletes and control virtually every moment of the athlete's daily schedule and their lives. Nevia says there are great coaches in the college system that do it right. But he says schools and the NCAA do not have proper reporting mechanisms for addressing coaches who don't. It really makes me wonder why the university, like many organizations, is, is so keen to sweep allegations under the rug and hope that they go away. Rebecca Eisenberg specializes in employment issues and educational matters. She says Title IX offers some protection but not enough and says schools need to take what these athletes are saying more seriously. A woman's testimony is evidence. That's evidence. So I think that we need to be willing to believe and able to believe these women. This is a state university run by our taxpayer money. I mean, we all as taxpayers in California have standing here. And while bigger, broader questions need to be asked of the schools and the NCAA, the players we talk to are on their own journeys. Players told us they have sought therapy and even medication because as one player explained, my self-esteem was so low and my anxiety so high, I was starting to lose my ability to perform daily functions. Everyone asked me like how, how physically demanding was it to play like a college, like a sport in college and it's the mental side that's so much harder. Indigo Gibson says to this day, it is the fear of Neil that sticks out in my head. She also writes, since I graduated, and hung up my cleats for the last time. I have made it a priority to repress these experiences. In my opinion, he kind of ruined it for me. Many of the women we talk to say this isn't just about soccer, but about the university they still love. The soccer was horrible, but I loved Cal, thank goodness. I want to be a proud Cal alum. I don't want to have it just be like a dark stain that I try to forget. I don't. I don't want to have to sweep my experiences under the rug. And their hope is to move on. You want him fired? Yes, I want him fired. My way of sort of making peace with it and being able to move on is 
knowing that I did my part to make sure that he doesn't have the opportunity to do what he did to me or to my teammates to anybody else ever again. There are girls that are committed to the school right now that will be here next year and a few years and I just want them to know the truth. And so they tell their story to those who want to listen and to those who don't. For all those little girls who love soccer just as much as they did. Try to sweep me under the rug now. Like, you're not going to be able to. Um, and I'm just, we're just not going to go away. We're just not going to, we're not going to let them keep hurting people the way that they hurt us. So what's next? The players say they are going to try to move on. There is litigation underway. And as officials told us, Cal is reviewing this matter. We'll have to wait to see what that review concludes. Thanks for joining us for this special investigation, Surviving the Game. You can follow all the developments on this story at KTVU.com or by downloading the KTVU News app. I'm Claudine Wong, and we'll see you on air and online.